Thanks everyone for joining. This is the third and final session in the machine learning workshop series. Uh, my name is Louise Kapner and I'm also here with Nadia Kanar and she'll be taking the R demonstration. But if you're after Python, I'll be taking that in the first hour. And then yeah, stick around if you want to know how to you know do the code in R. If you want to um, follow through the code and execute it at the same time as me, what you can do is you can navigate to our GitHub um, and our machine learning workshop repo. And you'll see this little button here in the readme file that says um, launch binder. If you click on that, it's basically going to bring up um, this here. If you go into Python code and you click on machine, learn, machine learning uh, code demo, you can then follow through the code with me. So yeah, um, let's get started then. So the first thing you want to you're going to want to do um, when you're working in Python and you're doing a bit of machine learning is you're going to need to import all of the necessary packages. So um, you can see that I have a number of packages such as pandas, which helps me manipulate my data set. I've got numpy, which has lots of important mathematical functions and matplotlib and seaborn, which are great for creating visualizations and um, other well-known packages, which are going to help me carry out machine learning. So you can see we've got um, scikit-learn. Um, we've also got scipy for our hierarchical clustering. So one second, I'm just getting things started. OK. So yeah, now we can go ahead and load in the data set. And um, today we're going to be working with the iris data set, which you'll no doubt remember from last week's session on clustering. If not, don't worry, there's a little brief description of it here. So the iris data set contains 50 samples from each of three species of iris flowers. So we've got iris setosa, iris virginica and iris versicola. And they each, um, all of the data points have four features that were measured from each sample. So we've got the length and the width of the sepals and the petals, which have each been measured in centimeters. So yeah. So we've run that first cell. Now let's load up our iris data set. And I've got a little description here of um, what a parameter is and what a function is. So you can just give that a little brief um, read over if you need to. Um, parameters in Python are variables. So they're placeholders for the actual values that the function needs. And when the function's called, these values are passed in as arguments. So in this case, we've got this um, function here from pandas called read CSV. So that's our function. And the file path is the parameter. And this um, specific um, pathway here to my iris CSV is the argument because that's the value that I've passed in. So you can go and um, read over that if you just want a bit more clarity. Okay, so now we're gonna get stuck into our first centroid-based clustering algorithm, and that's the k-means algorithm. First though, um, as I mentioned in the presentation, it's always good to explore our data and also see if everything's up to scratch. Also, just a little reminder here in the code. So clustering algorithms work with unlabeled data. So for the purposes of this demonstration, we're going to be largely ignoring the variety or species column, which you know tells us the species of each of our 150 data points. So yeah, first things first, when you import data into any coding environment, it's always good to see if it's all looking as it should do. So sometimes when you read in um, the data, you'll realize that you know your column headings are on the wrong row or something. So a good function that you can use is uh, the pandas function head. And that just gives you the first five rows of your data set. So it's really good at just you know making sure all the columns are okay. We've got all our information that we need. And then we have the following two functions. So we have info, and that's a really helpful function um, that can be used with a pandas data frame to give a bit more of a detailed overview. So when we run this, we can see 
you know, the number of columns, if there's any missing data, and also the data type of each of our columns. So yeah, fortunately, because this is, you know, quite a beginner data set, we have no missing values or sort of difficult data types to contend with. And we can go on to the next step. So yeah, we can do a value count here as well. So that reveals that there is 50 samples for each species. Another really good function um, is the describe function. And that tells us a lot about the statistical variation in our data. And it's really helpful when it comes to performing unsupervised learning. If there are certain columns or features of our data which have a higher variance, this is going to affect how the k-means distance measure works. So what we can do is you can use this function to then check if we need to standardize our feature variables. So you can see here we've got the means for each of our features, and we've got the standardized uh, the standard deviation as well for each of our four features. So for instance, we can see as well the variance. So yeah, um, I've got a little description here of why you might want to bother uh, standardizing the feature data. And that just goes into a bit more detail about the fact that um, you know, k-means uses the Euclidean distance to calculate the distance between data points and the centroids. So you want to ensure that the distance measure, distance measure accords equal weight to each variable. We don't want to end up putting more weight on variables that have a higher variance. So that's why it is important to, you know, have a look at the statistical variation in your data and then see if it does need um, some sort of, um, you know, scaling. So in this case, um, we see that the petal length is quite significantly different to the um, sepal length, sepal width and petal width. So what we want to do then is standardize our data. So to do this, we're going to use scikit-learn's pre-processing package, which comes with a standard scalar class. And that's a really quick way to perform feature scaling. But before we can do that, to be able to perform these mathematical computations, we're going to need an appropriate way of storing our feature variables without the column headings and the variety column getting in the way. So yeah, we separate our features from the target attribute because we don't want to have the species in our data set. So here um, we use this function iloc and that helps us select specific rows or columns from the data set. And then we're going to place the values of our features in a 2D array. So we can use um, this here to slice our array and this will print the first 10 values in the array. So let's give that a look. So here we go. We've now got an array, 2D array of our values for the features. Then what we're gonna do is we're gonna create a variable here I've labeled it SS for standard scalar, and that contains our feature scaling function. Then what we do is we fit the standard scalar to the data. So we fit it to this, um, to the array that we've created. And what this will do is it computes the mean and the standard deviation. And then the transform part basically scales that data. So it means that um, we'll have a, mean that is um, very close to zero and our standard deviation for each um, feature should be very close to one. So let's give that a look. So yeah, we can see that it's uh, transformed our data here. So that's just viewing the first. Um, what I've done here is I basically put that um, 2D array back into a data frame and then I've used head to print out the first five rows of the data. So this is the data once it's been scaled. Now what we can do here is we can use the describe function on our um, data frame of uh, scaled variables, and we can see if the you know the standard scaler has done its job right. And as you can see, it has because we can now see the mean for each feature variable is very close to zero, and the standard deviation for each variable is very close to one. 
So that's um, your pre-processing done. And that's a really important part of making sure that your data is ready to be you know, used in a clustering algorithm. So now we're at the stage where we can give clustering a go. So of course, with this data set, we're in the unique position of already knowing the optimum number of clusters. So, you know, we have free speech, uh, species, so we're expecting to find free clusters. But for now, what I'm going to do is just pretend that we don't know that, and we're going to randomly set our k value to 5. And to cluster our data, we can use the k-means class, and that comes with the scikit-learn package. And it has the following parameters. So if you remember, the parameters are the things that you supply arguments for. So when we supply an argument, let's go back to here. So the parameter is the file path and the argument is the specific file path that we supply it with. So your k-means class has different parameters. So there's different pieces of information that you can feed to the algorithm when you set it up. So let's go through some of them. So first we have the parameter init. And this is the method for initialization. So the standard version of the k-means algorithm is implemented by setting init to random. So some of you might remember, but that is Forgy's method uh, when I talked about initialization points, you know, how we pick those run those points that we're going to be using for the centroids. With Forgy, we just pick some random ones from the data set. There's other ways you can do it as well. We talked about the random partition method and there's another algorithm as well called k-means plus plus, which you can use. So you can actually change the init to k-means plus plus. And I do recommend after this, you know, just have a play around with these different parameters, change them, change, you know, the initialization method. And here we've also got, you know, the number of clusters. So that's, um, you're picking the k value here the number of clusters that you want the algorithm to form, as well as the number of um, centroids that you're going to generate. Then we have the number of initializations. So remember with the k-means, we have to initialize it more than once because of these random points. Um, two runs can converge on different cluster assignments. So it's important, you know, to make sure that you set this, um, to, you know, a fairly substantial number. Um, in the example below, I've set it to 10. So yeah, that's the default. So it performs 10 k-means runs, and then it returns the results of the one with the lowest sum of squared error. And that's our performance metric for our k-means algorithm. Then we have another parameter, so that's max iterations. And it refers to, yeah, the maximum number of iterations that the algorithm will perform for a single run. So for each of these 10 initializations that we're going to have, how many times are we going to let the algorithm, um, how, how many times are we going to let the code iterate through the algorithm? And we also have random state. And this just determines random number, number generation for centroid initialization. What we can do is we can use a integer to make the randomness deterministic. So basically all this means is you'll get the same exact points as me. So normally if this was set to none, it will just pick some, you know, random centroids, but we can kind of impose, um, you know, some, like I said, make this more deterministic if we all use the same number. So, you know, feel free to change it so that you don't get the exact same points as me or set it to none. Um, but here I've set it to 32. So we're all gonna be, um, producing the same, uh, we'll have the same coordinates for our centroids. So yeah, you can see that I've supplied my arguments here. I'm going to make sure that my initialization works by selecting the initialization points at random. And I've chosen five clusters. I want to initialize this algorithm 10 times with my random points. And I'm going to have 300 max iterations. So what we can do here is run this code. So we've got our model set up here. And what we need to do is fit this k-means with our scaled features. 
that we had before. So remember, we've performed scaling with our 2D array, then put it back into a data frame. So once we fit it, the code below will perform 10 runs of the k-means algorithm on the data. As I've said, with that maximum of 300 iterations per run. Let's go ahead and run that. And you can see it, it uh, just reiterates to us some important parameters. So once we've run this, we can access the lowest standard squared error value from the 10 initializations. And it's, this is also referred to as the inertia. So let's give that a run. And we can see we've got this value 91.6. We can also access our cluster centers. So this, is, this tells us the final locations of the centroids. And that comes in handy later when we want to plot this information and visualize our results. So yeah, these are the coordinates of the cluster centers for the k-means with the lowest sum of squared error value. There is also some other attributes that the k-means um, class has. So once you've built your model and you've run it, you can access the following information. So you can get the labels of each data point, which tells you, um, you know, which um, cluster number each data point was assigned to. We also have the number of iterations. So we can find out how many iterations it took before the algorithm converged. And you also have a couple of other attributes as well that I'm not going to go through in detail. So let's run this here and see how many iterations it took. Um, I've actually gave it away in the comments. So yeah, it took 13 iterations before the algorithm converged. And as I've said, we can also see which cluster label each data point has. Now let's go on to visualizing our results. So you can see here, we've got our five clusters. You might be wondering why it starts um, from zero and not from one, and that's just because in the weird world of computer science, we um, count from zero. So you can see this as our one to five. And you'll see we have the centroids um, plotted as well. We can also do a 3D visualization. So there you can see we have our clusters. So how can we go about finding the optimal number of clusters? So we've done this um, you know, random um, value for K, we've picked five. But to actually determine the optimal number, a crucial step in the K-means algorithm is using some sort of um, evaluation method. So I've put a little recap here. Um, I'm not gonna go through it entirely, um, apart from to say that the common method used to evaluate the appropriate number of clusters is the ELBA method. That involves running k-means clustering on the data set for a range of values for k. So for instance, from one to 10, then what we can do is compute the standard, um, the SSC, sorry, values for each k. The elbow method then reveals this sort of sweet, part, sweet spot where the SSE curve starts to bend. So that's its elbow point. And that's the point at which the, you know, we have diminishing returns that are no longer worth the additional cost. So we choose the number of clusters that adding another cluster doesn't produce a significantly better modeling of the data. So to do this, I create my dictionary of keyword arguments. So here you can see I want my initial initialization method to be random. I want my number of initializations again to be 10. And my max iterations is uh, going to be 300. And I've got the same random state. Then I create a variable SSE, which is an empty list. And then I'm going to iterate through each K value ranging from 1 to 10. Let's run this code. So you can see we get the error values from 
um, k equals 1 to k equals 10. And just from looking at these numbers, we can see that after around here, so we've got 114.412, you know, um, we notice that the inertia starts decreasing in a more linear fashion. So that does indicate that um, k equals 3 is going to be the optimum number. But plotting this is going to make it way more obvious, as we're then going to be able to observe the bend. So let's go ahead and do that. So you can see here that we've got this elbow around three. But sometimes the graph isn't going to always be that clear. And you might want a more straightforward means of acquiring the elbow point. So to do this, you can use this package called need. And that comes with the knee locator class, which determines the elbow point programmatically. So let's see if it matches our observation that k should equals three. So yeah, we can see when we access the elbow var variable that it, it returns free. So now what we can do is create a model where we pick free as our number of clusters with the same number of itera initializations, the same number of um, maximum iterations, and we've got the random state again set to 32. So let's give this a run. And then remember, it's important that we fit our data. And we can then plot this later. But you'll remember, or if you don't remember, in the clustering presentation, I also talked about something called the silhouette co coefficient. And that kind of is another um, evaluation method you can use to determine how good um, your clusters are. So it's used to evaluate the density and separation between clusters. The score is calculated by averaging the silhouette coefficient for each sample. And that's computed as the difference between the average intra cluster distance and the mean nearest cluster distance for each sample. And then is normalized by the maximum value. So it produces a score between minus one and plus one, where scores near plus one indicate high separation and scores near minus one indicate that samples might have been assigned to the wrong cluster. So yeah, I've got um, a TLDR here as well. So it means if it's nearer to one, the clusters are, you know, they're far apart from each other and they're clearly distinguished. So let's look at the silhouette score for K means with the K set to three. So we've got the score 0 0.46 around that. And then we can use this silhouette visualizer to then show the silhouette plot. So you can see that the graph contains these sort of homogeneous and long silhouettes. And the vertical red dotted line is um, equal to this silhouette score here. So that indicates the average silhouette score for all observations. So, you know, this is not bad. Um, and what we can do is we can then compare it to the silhouette score for k-means when we set it to five. You can see it's quite a bit lower. And we can see that these are not as homogenous as what we get for our k when it's k equals three. I'm also going to show you that you can visualize this data as well. So we're going to use matplotlib to do a scatter plot. So yeah, you can see that we've got this cluster here that's quite well separated. But these two clusters are not as well separated. So it's been harder for the um, algorithm to cluster this data. We've got our centroids here as well. We can also do a 3D visualization. Um, so I'll just show you this. So yeah, as you can see, this um, 
cluster one, so if you think of this as one, two, and three, remember in computer science, we start counting from zero. So the first cluster here is quite well separated, but it's been harder for the algorithm to separate um, these two clusters here. You can see the points are much more overlapping. And we'll talk about that bit more a bit more when we move on to hierarchical clustering now. So for those that don't remember, hierarchical clustering, also known as hierarchical cluster analysis, is an algorithm that groups similar objects into groups called clusters. And the endpoint is a set of clusters where each cluster is distinct from each other cluster, and the objects within each cluster are broadly similar to each other. So let's see if the clusters that we get from hierarchical clustering align with the irises um, taxon taxonomical classification. So we will be using the labels for some of this, and that's just to compare how well hierarchical clustering does. So I'm gonna show you here as well, some different methods for exploring the data. And I'm gonna start with a correlation matrix. Um, where are we? Okay. So a correlation matrix is a table showing the correlation coefficients between variables. So each cell in the table is going to show the correlation between two variables. We can compute it here by using iLock again to access um, our columns. And then we can just use this correlation function to compute the correlation between our variables. But as I've said um, here, it's pretty boring to look at. So we can create a visualization which makes these correlations more explicit. And we do this by creating a numpy, numpy array of Boolean values from the um, matrix correlation data frame. So that's the data frame that we created here. So yeah, from this output, we can see that there's a positive correlation between our petal length and petal width attributes, which is a pretty good indication for clustering. There's also quite a strong correlation between our sepal length and petal length as well. And we have also a correlation between sepal width and petal length, albeit a negative one. Whereas sepal length is very weakly correlated with the other attributes. So this tells us the following information. Longer petals also tend to be wider. And flower, flowers with longer petals also tend to have longer sepals. And flowers with longer sepals tend to have wider petals as well. So another um, data exploration technique we can use is to plot some pair grids. So pair grids or pair plots are great for multivariate analysis as they plot pairwise relationships in the data set. So we can use this function from Seaborn to plot a different function on the diagonal as well to show the univariate distribution of the variable in each column. So let's run this code here. From this, we can see that there are two easily distinguishable groups. We have one with long petals and somewhat longer and thinner sepals, and one with short petals and relatively short and thick sepals. So from this, we already know, of course, that um, there are samples from three species in the data set. But it seems that um, it will be easy to sort of separate one of these clusters, whereas classifying the other two won't be so easy. And we can see that if we go back to our k-means. So it's really easy for us to separate this first cluster here, but it's much harder for these two clusters. So let's first for our single linkage dendrogram. And we do this using the SciPy um, 
dendrogram function. And what we do is we create our linkage. So remember, we talked about our link linkage criterion. Um, we use loc to get the um, values for our different feature variables. So we've got staple length, settle width, petal length, and petal width. And then you specify the method here. So you supply it with the argument that you're, you know, the specific uh, linkage criterion that you're going to use. So we're using single linkage here. Then we've just got our figure size that's set in how big the um, graph image will be. So once we've created this um, distance matrix, so I've called it here, I've just called it a variable dist sim or uh, single linkage. We can then also uh, specify the leaf rotation. So I've just set that to 90 degrees. I've also, I'll just run it so we can see this a bit more clearly. Okay. So yeah, you can see I've also given it a title. So dendrogram single method, I've set my font size and I've got my Y label as distance and my X label as index. So from this, it suggests the existence of two clusters, but it's not so clear that we have a third cluster here. And if I didn't know that the data set contains data from, from three species, I would then stop at two. But of course, we have the advantage of knowing that the label data set outlines three species. So we can use some different linkage criterion to further investigate you know, whether we can find a better clustering solution. For this data set. But obviously, when it comes to hierarchical clustering, I talked about this in the presentation, you can get some sort of hard to read visualizations, and it can be a bit messy, you know, this is quite a lot <laughs> to look at. So SciPy's dendrogram function does have a number of parameters that you can play around with to make a, a messy dendrogram a bit easier to read. So it has um, these parameters, um, truncate mode. So that's used to condense the dendrogram. And it has um, this first one, which I put, um, which is important. And it shows um, only the last P merged clusters. So you can set it to show, you know, only the last 20 merged clusters or only the last, um, you know, 50. And we also have color threshold. So we can make sure that all clusters below a specific value are given dis different colors. So let's go through this here. And I'll just explain a bit about how I did this. So again, remember we have our distance matrix. So I've created this variable here. And then we have the linkage, which has been set to single. So single linkage, and we've accessed our feature variables. We made sure that the plot is a certain size. Then we supply the dendrogram function with our distance um, matrix. Uh, we make sure the leaves are rotated to 90 degrees. And here you can see I've supplied it with this truncate mode, last P. And I've set it so that it only shows me the last 50 um, merged clusters. And I've set my color threshold to 0 0.81. And I do that to show that we have actually got three clusters here, but as you can see, it's not done very well. And from first glance, you know, we've only got two clearly distinguished clusters. So if that's a bit easier to see, um, you can see 0 0.8. I made sure it had different colors below here because you can see we have got two points that have been clustered. Um, you know, that have been put into their own unique cluster. So there are three clusters distinguishable here, but um, not very well. And to sort of investigate how much these clusters differ from the taxonomical classification, we can use a SciPy function called F cluster. And that basically flattens the dendrogram. And then it allows us to obtain the cluster values for the original data points. So it tells us which uh, clusters the data points were assigned to. And obviously we have this advantage because the IRIS data set is uh, traditionally a labeled data set. So it has the, the following parameters. Um, 
Z, and this is the hierarchical clustering matrix returned by the linkage function. So in our case, this is our variable uh, dist sin. So that's our distance matrix. Um, we have T, which is just in the, in the maximum number of clusters that we want. And we have criterion. So the criterion that we use to flatten the clusters. In our case, we're just using max clusters. And that means we want to impose a threshold on the number of class, uh, flat clusters that the function returns. And what this will allow us to do is to see how much the clusters differ from the actual species. So you can see what I've done here is just appended the cluster assignments onto my iris data set. So I've copied my, when we first read in the data, we called it iris. I've just copied that and then I've put this to here so we can um, leave our original iris data set intact. And um, let's just run this. So we can see the assignment again, this head, head just um, prints out the first five rows of a data frame. And let's um, see some visualizations using a cluster. I'm just going to expand these so you can see them as I talk about them. Um, just widen this out a bit. Okay. So we can see that from our three plots, that our single linkage method has not been able to find three groups in the data. So you can see, as I mentioned before, we have only two data points um, in a third cluster. So if you see here, these are these two data points here. It's not really done very well at distinguishing our three clusters. Whereas we can see, this is the how the data set actually is with um, each data point and, um, with its proper label. We can see Satosa, that's our first cluster, which is really easily separated from the other two. And then we have our sort of messier um, clusters of Versicola and Virginica. So another thing that we can do is use a swarm plot to take a further look at how they've been assigned. And that's another way of basically plotting the distribution of an attribute. It's basically a scatter plot, but where one variable is cat categorical. So in this case, we have a categorical variable, which is our species or variety. So that's, you know, Citosa, Virginica, Versicola. So let's see, we use the Seaborn function swarm plot to do this. And we set our X as variety and our Y as two clusters. And then we do the same, but for three clusters. So let's have a look at this. So yeah, this shows us that we have these two clusters that have been um, assigned, you know, to their own cluster, which is not great. Um, what we really want is like three clearly separated clusters. What we can also do is create a heat map of our feature means, and that can tell us a bit more about the details of the two clusters that we have managed to find. Because we have found um, it's, there's clearly two big clusters here. You can see it better here. So let's see if we can find out a bit more about the, um, the means of these um, clusters. So I use a Seaborn function again which is heat map. And I use loc again to access all my um, feature variables, uh, my feature values, sorry. And then I use this function here for the mean. And I set the annotation to true so that we can see the exact mean values. And yeah, here what I've done is I've just put it in a um, data frame. 
so you can also read it uh, quite easy as well. It has the uh, more specific, um, has the full um, values. So what we can um, find out from this is what are two main clusters look like? So what are the features like for these two main clusters that we've identified in our dendrogram? So in the first cluster, we can see that we have quite small petals. So the length is the mean of um, the width is quite small. And um, so is the length. But we can see that we have relatively thick sepals. Whereas for cluster two, you can see the petal length is much longer. So we have quite long petals. And we have quite long sepals as well. So as you can see, the means here differ quite a bit. So we can then compare this to a different hierarchical clustering method. Um, we all spoke about the complete linkage method. So let's see how well this replicates that taxonomical species of the iris flower. So here I've labeled my distance matrix um, dist comp, so for you know the complete linkage method. I select my attributes and I set my linkage method to complete. And we have the same, um, just basically the same as before, the figure size. So, you know, how big the graph's going to be. And I supply, that should be comp. Sorry about that. Um, so, yeah, I supply my dendrogram function with the distance matrix. And now we can see the results for this. Okay, let's just make sure that's all right. Yeah, sorry about that. Okay, um, so when we use this complete method, this seems to suggest a number of two or three clusters. And we can see how well these clusters replicate the, um, you know, the classification of the iris flowers if we um, use this flattening, which we'll do in a second. But for now, I'm just going to set some parameters so that we can have this dendrogram in a bit of a, you know, um, more visually pleasing format. So to do that, I um, use this truncate mode again. So I set the last P to 25. So I want to see the um, last 25 merged clusters. And you'll see why I set the color threshold as I do. So yeah, I put the color fresh threshold at four here so that we can see these two groups clearly. So you can see we have three clusters. And what we can do is the same thing that we did before, and we can flatten this um, hierarchical clustering. And then do some visualizations for our different K values. So you can see what it looks like if we split the dendrogram at different points. So basically what this is doing is splitting it at two clusters and splitting it at three clusters. So you see if we split it at two, we've got two sort of big clusters. When we split it at three, um, which is what I've you know basically um, shown here with the color threshold, you can see we have three clusters. So let's have a look at these visualizations. And you can see that our complete, complete linkage method has been much more able to find free groups in the data. So you see it's um, when our k is equal to three. So when we perform that split, um, so we have three clusters, you can see that it's done a much better job if we compare this to the actual um, data point labels. So you can see again, it has found um, these two clusters quite difficult um, to separate, but not as bad as the single linkage method did. So a significant improvement there. And let's also refer to our swarm plot. So we use this um, 
swarm plot function from the seaborne package and we set our x again to variety and our y as the number of clusters so we've got a swarm plot for k equals two and a swarm plot for k equals three Again, you can see that Satosa, it's been really easy to separate this one, whereas it's been a bit more difficult here. But you can see that we have two, you know, it's, it's clearly easier to see that we have these two clusters. Whereas if we refer to the previous swarm plot for the single linkage method, where are we? You can see it was only able to put these two data points here. Again, what we can do is create a heat map of our feature means. So, yep, we use look to get the values for our features. And then we use this mean function here. Let's see what we get. So this tells us some information about our three clusters that we have. It shows that um, cluster one has the largest flowers. So we can see the petal length is clearly the largest. And it's also got the longest um, sepal length as well. Then we have our second cluster, which is more medium sized flowers. So the sepal length is a bit smaller, so the mean differs um, quite a bit. We've got the sepal width is a bit smaller than we had in the first cluster. And the petal length as well is also smaller, as well as the petal width. And then we have our tiny flowers. So we can see that the sepal length is um, smaller than the second cluster, not by much, but, you know, a bit. Then we've got our sepal width, which is the only um, the only feature here where the mean is actually slightly higher than the um, first and second cluster. But the petal length is by far the smallest and also the petal width. So you can see we've distinguished um, some features of our three clusters quite well with the complete linkage method. And I also have as well, um, I've just put here um, some information about uh, principal component analysis, but these um, are really good um, medium articles and also a tutorial of how to implement uh, principal component analysis in Python because I don't quite have time to do it here as we are currently 10, uh, 10 minutes to two. Um, but I really um, suggest that you follow these links and have a look at how you can use principal component analysis to, um, you know, handle them um, data sets that have sort of higher dimensionality where you can't, you know, visualize results because we'll be, be able to um, visualize them um, in a 3D graph, but obviously we can't go beyond that. Um, so you can try using some principal component analysis on the iris data set.